Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to today's broadcast. You know, all month long, we've been talking about how to have success without destroying your life. And that's really, really important. You know, one of God's promises is that He will give us success and He'll add no trouble with it. In other words, God has a way to give us success. And by the way, I don't, I don't know where your mind goes when you think about success. And so, you know, there are some people that you, the minute you start talking about success, they pass a judgment and assume that you're talking about greed, that you're talking about selfishness and all this. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. When I talk about success, I'm talking about the biblical kind of success, which is all about uh, uh, having more than enough to meet your own needs, but having enough to be generous for other people, having enough to live a life of, of ease, honestly, is what the Bible is presenting with the whole concept of prosperity. Now, ease or prosperity will destroy a fool. It is the destruction of a fool. And a fool is a person who will not learn by personal instruction. Now, God gives us personal instruction in His Word, and then by His Spirit, He will speak to our hearts and lead us through the application of His Word so that success doesn't destroy us. You know, a we kind of have these, these concepts of God and God's promises and God's Word uh, that, that it's, it's, it's like these things are bad, these things are good. And if you do these things or want these things, you're bad. If you do these things or want these things, you're good. Well, the truth is that's, that's really not the kind of concept that the Bible presents because uh, mo- almost everything can be good or can be evil And that is all determined by what's in your heart, what's your motive, what's your intention. You know, Jesus made a statement one time in talking to his disciples about how that uh, it was really, really difficult for a person, a rich person, to uh, enter into the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is that realm where where we are surrendered to and trusted trusting Jesus as Lord. And, and as such, we have access to all the resources of heaven, which is what is called the kingdom of heaven. And, and so we have heaven here on earth when we live in the kingdom of God. But that's all based on trusting Jesus as Lord, which, uh, which means I take God's word and apply it the way Jesus taught it to be applied. And so his disciples just kind of had a freak out about that. Uh, and, and, and he had to come back and explain to him, look, I, I'm not saying that r- the fact that they're rich is what keeps them out of the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, it's the fact that they trust in their riches. You see, you can't trust in your riches for safety and trust in Jesus as Lord. You can't, tr- you can't trust in anything else to meet a need in your life and trust Jesus as Lord in that area of your life. So, so over and over and over again, the Bible makes it clear that God wants us to succeed. He wants us to prosper. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to multiply. You know, we started out this whole series uh, the first week of January, which if you haven't listened to this all this month, you, you want to listen to this. But we were, we were talking about how that when God told man to go out and be fruitful and multiply, that wasn't just merely talking about having a bunch of kids the way we uh, tend to translate or interpret that today. He was talking about being fruitful in all of the endeavors of your hands and multiplying and being influential everywhere you go. Now, did that include having a lot of kids? Well, sure, because kids were kids were wealth back in, in, in uh, ancient times, whereas today kids are kind of keeping from having wealth. But, but God has always wanted man to have a great life. This was proven in the Garden of Eden where God was able to establish earth um, by His will, not by anybody else's will, not by what man wanted. He established Eden based on what He wanted. And God has been trying ever since man rebelled and brought the curse on, onto the earth, man has been trying to bring man, uh, God has been trying to bring man back to heaven on earth. So, you know, if you struggle with a, with the whole idea of God wanting you to prosper, God wanting you to be successful, you need to go back and 
And, you know, go online. If you don't have a good uh, concordance on your computer, go online and find you a, a biblical concordance. Look up every single word in the Bible about success, about prosperity, about wealth, about riches. Look up every single word and you're going to see that, that it can go good or bad either way. And you say, okay, if it can go good or bad either way, then I know that the pivotal factor is the motive of my heart. And, and if you don't solve the question about God's willingness or God's desire for you to have an incredible life, then, I, I, then you're gonna struggle forever. And you're not just gonna struggle in the area of, of success and wealth, you're going to struggle in the area uh, of, of enjoying the life that Jesus came to give us. Keep in mind, Jesus himself said, I have come to give you life, and the King James says, and to have it more abundantly. What do you mean more abundantly? In other words, more, more abundant than you've ever known it, more abundant than you've ever seen it. Or as one translation says, I've come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. Now, we know that the, that the Greek word for life, zoe, comes from a word that means to have a quality of life that's possessed by the one who gives it. Jesus lived the quality of life here on planet Earth because he was surrendered to God. And he says, now this is what I'm giving you. I'm giving you the opportunity to live in this same quality of life that I have received from God. Freely I've received, freely I'm given. Now you got to decide if you're going to take me up on it. You know, one of the greatest fake religious uh, questions that we have, uh, and I hear people say it all the time, is, well, you know, is it, is it God's will? As a matter of fact, some people, every time they pray a prayer, at the end of it, it's like, if it be thy will. Well, let me tell you something. If you don't know something is God's will, you can't be in faith. In other words, you can't trust uh, that God is going to do something if you are not absolutely certain, immovable about the fact that whatever it is that you're talking to him about is, in fact, his will. Now, we, honestly, we just play a religious game with ourselves. Oh, God, is this your will? But you know, when God says something hundreds of times in the scriptures uh, that he wants this for man, this is obviously his will. Now, religion gets us all messed up because religion will say, yeah, God said he wants you to have it, but oh, there's all these stipulations. Well, you know what? Uh, if you put stipulations on something that, that's not in the Bible, then really you are just playing a game with yourself and a game with God. And that game is, I really don't believe the truth. I really don't believe God's Word. So I've got to come up with some kind of theology. I've got to come up with some kind of justification for not trusting and pursuing God. I want to show you one of the first places that happened in the Bible, one of the most powerful places that that happened in the Bible. You know what? Uh, uh, when you think about this thing about, you know, about God's will, uh, one of the scriptures that always comes to me every, every time that that, that that concept crosses my mind is, is, the whole, is when Jesus uh, was ministering, and it was in Mark 10, it presents this situation where he goes to somebody and he says, uh, and, and the man says, uh, 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 or Jesus says to the man, he said, what wilt thou that I should do for you? Now, we read that. I don't know, I don't know where, we, where we go with that and how crazy you know, we can get with that. But basically, he is saying, what are you willing to let me do for you? Now, we've mentioned, I've mentioned this every, every single week probably in this, in this series. But I want you to realize something. Uh, most of the time, when we're saying is this God's will? We are really creating a smoke screen. I mean, either, we, or either we're not reading the Bible and we don't know what the Word of God says. So, so you know, if you, don't, if you don't bother to read the Bible for yourself, if you take everybody else's word on what the Bible says, I got news for you. You're always going to be confused uh, because you're not listening to God when you do that. You're listening to man. You say, yeah, but this is my pastor. I trust him. Or this is my father that told me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if he's your mother. It doesn't matter if he's your father. It doesn't matter if he's your pastor. It does not matter who it is. You have a personal responsibility to go to the Word of God. Read it for yourself. And, and, and not interpret it based on what everybody else tells you. Interpret it based on what Jesus taught, how Jesus treated people, and what Jesus accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection.
So Jesus is coming up to this guy's like, well, what, what are you willing to let me do? Now we talked about this last week about you know how that that, that once that beggar took off that robe that gave him the legal right to beg, man, he was fully committed to trusting God at that point. You know, I remember years ago, uh, uh, Rick Trussell, who is, he and I have worked together since back in the 70s, we were doing a meeting in a city not far from here. And man, it, it was one of those meetings that just turned into a wild uh, fiasco in the best kind of way. There was no controlling what was happening in that meeting. But uh, there was a man who worked for the fire department who had been injured. And, you know, they had to bring a special chair for him to sit in in the services. And, uh, you know, he, could, he couldn't go up and down stairs. He had difficulty, you know, walking. He had difficulty standing for very long. And like I said, the only way he could come to church if they had a special chair back there for him to sit in. And so, you know, we had one of those days where suddenly, man, it's all happening. Suddenly people are getting healed. Uh, uh, you know, the Spirit of God is moving in this incredible, incredible way. And, uh, and this guy ends up getting healed. And I'm telling you, he gets up and, man, he walks up and down the steps. He, you know, he, he, he kind of marches around. And so Rick was with me taking pictures of things that, the things that were happening in the meeting. Well, this guy immediately got upset because he did not want those pictures to be in our magazine or seen by anybody for fear that he might lose his disability. Well, you know something, that's what you call secondary gain. He had a reason to not want to throw himself totally on God. He had a reason that he, when he faced the possibility of losing his disability and going back to work, he wasn't really sure if that's, if that's what he wanted. I, to, I think I told you the story about the, the blind uh, Christian singer that, got, that her eyes were opened in one of my crusades. She did not want it. She would not have it because her whole sense of identity was built around the fact that she was the blind Christian singer. And so there's secondary gain. There's reason, there's a lot of reasons, all kinds of reasons that people don't really want to, when they make these resolutions, it's sort of like, this is something I sort of wish I had. It's something I kind of would like to have. But when it gets down to what would it take for me to actually make this journey? Because, because stop and think about it. When you start talking about being a success, you're not ta just talking about what you do. You're talking about becoming that person. See, most of us, when we make a resolution uh, I, and we involve God, we just want him to magically make that resolution come to pass because uh, 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 it's not something that we really want to put forth the effort to do. It's not something that we want to be inconvenienced for. As a matter of fact, it's something that, that in most cases, all it would take would, would be a change in our behavior and a change in dealing with some of our beliefs. And we could easily have almost anything that we have decided and any resolution that we make. But, but the truth is, if we really wanted it, we talked about this last week, how bad do I want it? If we really wanted it, we would pursue it with all of our heart. Now, even God himself can only be found when you search for him all of your heart. You know, people, people always are whining about, you know, I just, I just don't ever hear from God. Jim, you talk about hearing from God and him leading you in business, and, and I don't ever hear from God. Well, you know what? If you don't ever hear from God, it's because there are things you want to hear more than you want to hear God. And I know that sounds mean. I know you may be saying, I'm turning this off. I'm not listening to it. Well, you know, if you do, you're just going to miss a chance to move forward in your life. You know, we have talked about this. Uh, you know, Jesus told us, and this applies to any aspect of kingdom living. Now, see, when we read about the kingdom of God in the, in the New Testament, our tendency is in our minds to twist that, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, into what happens is what happens when a person gets born again. Well, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said that getting born again would make it possible for us to perceive the kingdom. Didn't say that that 
automatically meant that we entered it. You know, you get your sins forgiven and, you know, you get your ticket punched for heaven. That does not mean that in this life you are going to enter the kingdom of God and have the resources of heaven because that is something that happens as you trust and follow God for yourself, not follow formulas, not, you know, anything that I teach you, I want you to go pray about it. I want you to go read the Bible. I want you to find out if it's really there for yourself. And I want you to act on it because of what you find in the Bible, not because of what you've heard me say. But Jesus says, when it comes to entering the kingdom, he says, you've got to count the cost. See, so many times we don't count the cost. And when we run into an obstacle, man, we act surprised. Like, oh, no, oh, no, I, you never told me that I was going to have, that this was, could be hard. And it's like, well, wait a minute, don't you want it? You know, here's an interesting thing about the way, uh, uh, the, way uh, the heart and the mind work. We were created to live in pleasure and avoid pain. You say, well, well, how can you say it? I thought pleasure was evil? No, pleasure is not evil. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us, I believe it's in Titus maybe 2.10, the last part of that verse, that God's given us everything for our pleasure. I think that's, I think that's where it is. It may not be. But God wants you, to have, wants you to have, He gave us everything here for our enjoyment, for our pleasure. Why? Man, He wants us to realize that He's a good God who loves us, who loves us all the time, wants us to have the very best, working hard for us to have the very best. And, 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 and through creation, we didn't even have to ask Him to do it. He just made it possible. And when we work His process, all things do work out to our good. But when we work our own process, they turn out to be a mess. We blame God for them, get upset with God. But uh, uh, many times we'll start down the road, like I say, and we'll run into something that's challenging. No, let me tell you something. Here's the way our mind and our heart works. I'm designed to live in pleasure and avoid pain. Even my nervous system is designed that way. It's called fight or flight. You know, when I come into pain, when I come into suffering, or when I come into perceived, you know, perceived pain, whether it's real or not, I will fight the, the situation or I will run from the situation because, because I'm not designed to live in pain. I am not designed to live in suffering. It's crazy that religion tries to tell you you're supposed to suffer. That's how God's going to develop you. That's all nonsense. That is that's Luciferian, straight from hell doctrine. And good people have been deceived into believing and even preaching it. And they're good people. They're godly people. But it doesn't mean that they got their theology straight. Now, now, one of the things about this that's interesting is this. I am willing to face pain if the pleasure on the other side of that pain, number one, if it's a great enough pleasure. In other words, if, it, if it's big enough, I'll go through some pain to get there. Or if it's sure, if the pleasure is sure, I'll face the pain. See, that's what fight or flight is. Fight or flight doesn't mean you're always trying to just get away from the situation. Fight can mean you're fighting through the situation. And I'm telling you, if the promise is sure in your heart, you will fight through the situation. If the promise is not sure in your heart, you will fight against it and run. You'll, you'll, you will not stay and face this. That's why Jesus said you better count the cost. You need to know what you're going to face so you won't be surprised whenever you encounter it. Well, here's one of the things that I'm convinced of. I believe that so many people who are struggling with success and struggling with living their dreams, the real problem is they have counted the cost and they're afraid it is going to be too hard. Now, the Lord is our shepherd. He is Jehovah Rohi. He, he leads us in paths of how it should be. He leads us in paths that harmonize us with God. He leads us in paths to enjoy the very best life possible. And remember, God himself promised that he could bring you into a great life and you would not have trouble. You would not have pain uh, in the way that he would fulfill his promise. Now, Isaiah 119 says this, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Now, one of the things I've taught you for years is the word willing and the, and the word obedience is a continuum. And as a continuum, this means that 
that, uh, uh, excuse me, the word hearing and obeying, and which gets into willingness. And so if we do not, if we're not willing to obey, that's where the willingness factor comes in. If we're not willing to obey, we won't hear what God is saying to us. And so there has to be a willing, number one, a willingness to obey, but also then the willingness to hear, the willingness to follow God, the willingness to trust Him, the willingness to step into, into a different life. Now, God, like I said, God's going to lead you into success, but you've got to be willing to follow. Now, if there's anything that you won't do, and I'm talking not about anything evil, and I'm not talking about something that's, that, you know, that's going to destroy your life. I'm, but if there's anything, any place where you won't obey God, if, you don't, if you're not willing to obey God, it's because you don't believe that He is going to make it easy to do. He doesn't, you don't believe He's going to give you His strength. You don't believe He's going to take you to the promises. And that's what He wants to do. So if you're not willing, then you, you're not going to be able to get the leadership that you need to navigate your way through difficult businesses, you know, difficult successes, or, you know, and all those kinds of things. You're going to do it by the sweat of your brow. It's going to get hard and you're going to quit. Now, and let me, let me mention this because we don't have much more time. I want you to know this month, I'm making you a special offer. I should have called it the success pack or something like that. But I am offering you some of the most incredible tools to make your life work that you can imagine. I am, I am offering you um, Wire, uh, Wire for Success, Program for Failure, the book. And I'm also offering you um, uh, the series that, that, uh, that's going to help you deal with your heart is called, it's called limitless living. It's getting past the limits that you put on your life. Now, I've been telling you all month of, of one free thing that you're going to get with that. You're going to also get a free download of moving your invisible boundaries. You're going to learn how to, how to, how to establish greater boundaries without destroying your life. But there's something I didn't tell you. When you get the book Wired for Success, you you're going to get the opportunity to participate in about a six-hour live conference where I'm teaching Wired for Success, where I'm teaching these principles, and we're going to give you free access. This is really incredible. This is a success pack if there ever was one. And I know I didn't mention the live uh, uh, video conference that you're going to get to participate in uh, online, but, but you're going to get to. And I'm telling you, you're going to have the tools to, to make this journey. Now, one of the reasons it's so important for you to, to get these tools is because if you, if you know the promises and if you have the tools to influence your heart and if you are willing then to follow God, I got news where your life's going to get better and better and better, easier and easier and easier. Jesus said that if you, if you harmonize with him, then what's going to happen in your life is going to be easy and light. God wants this to be easy and light. He does not want it to be hard. He does not want you suffering. He just wants you to trust Him and follow Him. Now, this sounds so silly, what I'm about to say, but you know, so many times, and I say this in conferences, I say this in counseling, I say this in coaching, uh, if you want to stop blowing up your life, sometimes it's just as simple as stop stepping on the landmines. You say, what in the heck are you talking about, Jim? That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. You see, if God has already given us everything we need in Jesus, He's already freely given us everything, then our faith isn't so much, isn't at all about, God, will you give me this? Our faith is not, can I get this? Can I take a hold of this? Our, my faith is more about, am I willing to stop doing the things that limit me? Am I willing to quit limiting God in my life? Am I willing to quit self-sabotaging? Now, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt to go to Canaan, this was the model that we're supposed to look at to understand our journey from salvation to entering the kingdom of God. And remember the kingdom of God being that realm 
where because we're surrendered to God, He fights our battles for us. Because we're surrendered to God, He leads us on the pathway. Because we're surrendered to God, we get to enjoy the abundance of, of the heaven, king, the kingdom of heaven. We get to enjoy all the resources of God. And because we're so ignorant about what happened in this wilderness journey, uh, we don't understand how we can make the journey. You know, the, the journey from Egypt to, from salvation to kingdom living should have taken about 11 days, I think it was. In other words, you, you should have been able to walk it in about 11 days. They spent 40 years making that journey. God did not lead them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. They chose to wander in the wilderness because they were not willing to go in and inherit the promises of God because they thought it would be too hard. They thought they would face challenges they couldn't face. They did not trust God to be who he said he was and trust God to be, to do what he said he could do. Psalm 78, talking about the children of Israel. And, and by the way, Psalms tells us that one of the biggest problems, they were not in their heart, they were not steadfast in the covenant. Well, that's what's wrong with the church today. It, it is Christians don't know the covenant. They don't know what God's promised. They don't know the provisions. They, 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 they don't understand the terms of the covenant. They are not steadfast in their heart and their covenant. So they're just kind of making up who God is as it goes. They're trying to use faith uh, from that perspective of, okay, I just got to shut my eyes and jump off the cliff. Let me tell you something. Faith is when you see something more clearly than you've ever seen anything in your life. But listen to this. The children of Israel, remember, they could have gone from Egypt to Canaan and had heaven on earth. They could have lived in houses they didn't build, eat vineyards that they didn't plant. They could have had the, the most incredible abundance in the ancient world given to them freely, and they didn't trust God. And, and here's what it says in Psalm 78, 41. It says, again and again, they tempted or tested God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Listen. Our greatest problem, we, we make resolutions, we make whimsical decisions that we're going to live a better quality of life and, you know, and we don't count the cost, we don't get serious with God, we don't go to His Word, discover His promises. And, you know, something uh, we don't remove from ourselves those beliefs, those ideas, those destructive behaviors that keep limiting God in our life. I'll tell you something. At, at drjimrichards.com, I've got hundreds of video series for free that you can go. I want to equip you to enter the kingdom of God and have a heaven here on earth and enjoy this incredibly, incredibly great life that Jesus paid for. And I hope you're going to respond to this offer, and I hope you're going to experience what thousands of people all around the world have experienced, uh, a revitalization of your life, of your dreams, of your success, of your prosperity, of the good things in your life. And listen, if this is helping you, be sure wherever you're watching this, on my website or on YouTube, write comments and tell about what you're getting out of this stuff and share this with people that you know will like this and bring benefit to their lives as well. You know what? I asked you in January not to make your resolution yet because I want to give you the tools to work with. So here it comes. I've already given you some great tools for this week, but in February, we're going to talk about taking the limits off God, and I'm going to give you tools that you can use to make your resolutions and reach the goal that you want to make. <laughs>